Amen. Good morning. Okay. Uh, okay. My title. A living death or a dying life? A living death or a dying life? All of us, by nature, are under the curse of Adam. And the curse of Adam is to know, not brother Adam, <laughs> Adam, our forefather. The curse of Adam is to know the life of the soul, but not the life of the spirit. And we all know the life of the soul. It's very familiar to us. We all know how to think and to reason and to feel and to have a consciousness of the world around us. We can have relationships with other people. We can plan for the future. We have desires and dreams and ambitions. And all of this is the life of the soul. But this life that we know is actually just a living death. Because what we do not know by nature, is the life of the Spirit. We don't know the life of God by nature. And we see this living death all around us because it has ways in which it is revealed. And I want to show you a couple of the ways that it's revealed. So turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 17, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. And I'm going to read through verse 19. I want you to see this. Pay attention. Now, this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So how is this living death revealed? What are some of the things that Paul talks about? You can speak out. Callousness, okay. Darkened understanding. Darkened understanding. Hardness, of hardness of heart. Okay, I want you to hear something. Callousness, hardness of heart, darkened understanding. Can you see those things? You can't see them. Are there things you can see in this verse? Given over to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Those things you can see. And this is an evidence of a living death. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2. I'll start in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. What evidences of living death do you see there? Speak out. Boldly, men. The passions of the flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. These things you can see. This is an evidence of living death. And the Bible is very, very clear. Unless there is divine intervention, mankind is doomed to live this death for as long as 
physical life lasts, and then on into eternity, an endless living death. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 3, there is no one who is righteous, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. This is living death. And this is the life that God sees all of us living without his intervention. Sometimes we have a hard time finding ourselves in these verses because what we don't understand is that what God sees is the potential for evil, not only the working out of evil. He looks and he sees a bottomless pit of depravity in the human heart, in every human heart. And it's really only when we come to grips with who God actually is, his purity and his righteousness and his holiness and his justice and his mercy and his tenderness and compassion. He is all of those things. That is his life. And then when we see our own life, which is just a living death, of sin and depravity and selfishness and pettiness and prejudice and bigotry, then we begin to understand the preciousness of the words, but God. But God. Because God has an answer for those who know the hopelessness of their own lives. A mighty answer. And that answer is Jesus. Because what did Jesus come proclaiming? He came proclaiming eternal life. Which is the thing that would destroy this living death. When they said... And you shall call his name Jesus. What was the reason they gave? Because he will save his people from their sins. His very name is salvation from the living death of humanity. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was dead, his friend Lazarus, he went and visited. And Martha came out and she said, Master, if you had just been here, he wouldn't have died. And he said, Martha, your brother will rise again. And she said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And he said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The essence of the gospel is that Jesus Christ possesses an eternal life in himself, this endless vitality and power that can be given into the souls of man to destroy the living death and to make them endlessly live with him. That is what the gospel is. If you want something that will destroy the power of sin in your life, trust me, it is not Pure Life Ministries. It is Jesus himself. It's not programs. It's not techniques. It's not behavior modification. It's a man, the God-man, Jesus, who possesses a life that can revolutionize your own life so that no longer are you living dead, but you are living. And I have to tell you, it's the only answer he has. 
If you came here looking for some other answer, he doesn't have one. It's the answer for sexual sin. It's the answer for anger. It's the answer for bitterness and prejudice. It's the answer for rebellion. It's the answer for depression. It's the answer for whatever so-called diagnosis you received. Jesus' life itself is the answer. And it's the answer for us today, and it will be the same answer in 50 trillion lifetimes when we are in heaven, living off of his eternal life. So the question becomes, how do I receive it? How do I get this vitality in me so that this curse, this living death that is so real to me becomes past and no longer known so that what becomes real to me is new life? Jesus' life will be no benefit to you unless it is experienced. It's not enough to be in church. It's not enough to be around people who have that life. It's not enough to study that life. It's not enough to be able to explain it. The only benefit is when it is your own life. Jesus said, my flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. My, my words are spirit and life. And so what he was telling us is that there is a way in which the life of God may come into us and be our own. Just like food. Right When food comes into you, it somehow becomes part of you. Suddenly, it gives you strength. It gives you energy. It makes you able to do certain things. You can, I mean, if you starve yourself, your life is draining. But Jesus has a kind of life that can come into us and become our own. And that is what you need because in Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 4, do you see yourself? Do you see living death? What you need is his own life. And he's willing to give it freely. So what I want to do is I want to spend the rest of the time looking at John chapter 12 asking the question, how do we receive this life? How does his life become our own? I'll start in verse 20 and read through verse 27. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks and they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies... It bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Let's pray.
Lord, you said that your words are spirit and life. And so I really do ask that you would give a lot of grace. Lord, make my words reflect your heart. And I pray that these men would have open ears, and for all the visitors, open ears, that all of us would learn how to truly follow after you on that path to life, Lord. I pray that you would subdue our flesh and subdue our minds and keep the enemy from distracting and harassing and accusing, Lord, but let your word be very clear this morning. In your name, amen. So I have three points that I got from these verses here. And the first one comes from verse 24. I'll read that and then I'll give you the point. Verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The, point, the first point is that for us to live, Jesus had to die. For us to live, Jesus had to die. When you look at Jesus' life, I mean, he really is without comparison. He's mind-boggling, really. When you take a close look at his life, his divinity and his humanity and the nobility of his calling and how um, self-sacrificing he was, how loving and kind, how fearless he was, or at least how amazingly he overcame every temptation. I mean, you see that he had a true understanding of life and a true understanding of man. He never opened his mouth and uttered anything but was the perfect words to speak. It was never an idle word, never a wasted moment. He never shied away from danger. He's amazing. It's obvious that this man had some kind of power that none of us possess. And, but then he kept telling everyone around him, I have to die. I have to die. And people just could not understand this. They couldn't grasp it. They had all of these conceptions about the Messiah. They were fine with the Messiah being an, an eminent religious leader or political leader or military leader. They had no issues with that. But a suffering and dying Messiah? They believed that what he came to do was to take national Israel, political Israel, and raise them up out of the ashes and back into the preeminent place among the nations. But he did not come to do that, at least not in the way they thought. What he came to do was to destroy the living death of sin in humanity. And in order to do that, Something more than teaching had to happen. Something more than an example had to happen. And he said clearly, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. If Jesus had lived a perfect life for a hundred thousand years, he would have remained alone in that life. Because this living death, this sin, 
that is in us is a devastating power. Sin in us is the thing that makes us unable to see beauty in God. When we look at him, there's nothing really attractive. There's nothing desirable. Isaiah 53 said, there was nothing about Jesus that made us attracted to him. Not because of him, because of us. Because we were full of sin. We can't see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's the thing that caused him to plead and plead and plead. And we ignored and ignored and found excuses. It's sin in us that makes us rebel at God's commandments. And there's nothing God can say to us that will deal with sin. I hope you can hear what I'm saying. There is not a single command that God can give that deals with sin. Because it cannot be touched with words. The more he commands... The more he outlines what we should do and what we ought to be, the more our nature goes deeper and deeper and deeper into rebellion. And eventually, we will ourselves to go to hell. That is what sin does, and that is what sin is. And sin had to have a decisive death blow before any man could be redeemed. And that is what Jesus did. He was our redeemer. He didn't come just to show us the way because it wouldn't have mattered. He had to open up a new and living way. And that is what he did. He became the head of a new race. In Adam, we all died. In Adam, we all fell. When God looked at Adam, he saw all of us in him. And when Adam took the bite of of, of the fruit, so did we in him. Sometimes we think, I wouldn't have done that. You did do that in God's eyes. And so Jesus lived the life that Adam didn't. Adam was faced with one temptation and he fell. Jesus faced every temptation possible and overcame. Sometimes we don't really honor how human Jesus was. He knew what it was like to be hungry and thirsty. And never once... Was he irritable or angry or selfish? He knew overwhelming fatigue and never once did he think of himself. He knew raging hormones. He was a man and never once did he allow it to turn into lust. He had more fame than you could imagine. People worshipped him, adored him, thronged him. They wanted to make him king. And not one time did he ever allow that adoring crowd to seduce him into arrogance, self-congratulation, selfish ambition, pride. He knew what it was like to be misunderstood And he never defended himself. Completely and utterly reviled. And he never returned evil for evil. He knew what it was like to be overlooked and rejected. And all he ever did in return was give and give and give again. He never shielded himself from pain. He never stopped loving. He never stopped giving. He never stopped sacrificing. And in the midst of his perfections, he took on himself the living death of sin. And then he drank 
the just consequences for those sins, the endless wrath of God. He absorbed it all into his being. <laughs> and when that happened, when Jesus Christ cried out, it is finished, a new and living way was opened through his broken body, a way back into the holy of holies, you think about the Old Testament. What kind of real fellowship could those people have with God? His full majesty and glory was dwelling in the holy of holies behind a veil. And only one man could go in, and only once a year, and never without blood. And he had all these rituals, and he could just barely go in and put incense on the altar so that it would shield him from the glory of God so they wouldn't die on the spot. What kind of, what kind of relationship can you have with that God? This holy and just God who cannot abide with sin or look on sin. There was only one way for us to have a relationship with God. And it was for God's justice to be satisfied. And it was satisfied in Christ. And when that happened, he made it possible not just to have a relationship with God, but for God to dwell inside of man. For the living Jesus to destroy the living death of man and make him live forever. We just have such a shallow view of what God has done for us. You know, without this death, we could hear his teaching and we could see his example and it would do us no good. I mean, look at the disciples before his death. They were selfish. They were self-centered. If people rubbed them the wrong way, they were willing to call down fire from heaven, destroy these people. They would angle for position and argue about who was the greatest. They were prejudiced. They didn't, they didn't even understand why Jesus came. And then look at them after his death. What a change. Because now the living Jesus could dwell inside of them and make them live his life. But there's more. Second point. For us to live, we must die. For us to live, we must die. Christ did open up a living way. And I hope that my words somehow were able to give you a sense of uh, the, the possibility for you, for your own life. Your life doesn't have to be the way it's been. And it doesn't have... Uh, it doesn't have everything to do with your ability. Christ's ability is able to make you live a totally different life. You should never think about the new life with the old one in view. Because it's a different kind of a life. It's a new nature. Something utterly foreign and alien to us. And when we think about our old lives and what God is calling us to, we should be like Abraham who said he considered his own body good as dead. Sarah, barren. Impossible. But that doesn't matter because what God is going to create is not something with the old, but something new. You can, for, in, in, in a sense, while you're here, as you're asking God for this new life, Forget your old life and ask him for something so utterly different, so foreign to you. Ask him for new desires, new inclinations, new goals and ambitions because Jesus is utterly different than you are. So Christ did open up a living way, but that way has to be walked. <laughs> it, 
If we're going to arrive at the same destination that Jesus did, we have to follow him. And this is not really what we, a lot of us were taught. We were probably taught something like this. Jesus died to give us new life but not taught that Jesus died to open up a pathway and then lead us in the same way that he walked. Let me read a quote. The American church is experiencing a crisis. For years we have preached a cheap gospel and peddled a soft savior. We've taught salvation without self-denial and crown without the cross. Our instant salvation message has dishonored God and confused men. Our faulty seeds have produced a flaky harvest, and what a pitiful crop we are reaping. American believers spend hours watching television, but minutes watching in prayer. We're hungry for the sports page, but have little taste for the word. We spend more money on pet food than on foreign missions. We love to feast, but hate to fast. We welcome God's message, but are weary of his burdens. Is this what Jesus died for? Is this our new life in him? Stop and think for a moment. Anyone who spends more time playing video games than seeking God in prayer has no right to call Jesus Lord. Anyone who takes delight in today's perverted soap operas is serving another God. Anyone who cannot die to sports for a season is worshiping idols. Anyone who loves the world will not experience the love of the Father. It is time for some serious soul searching. What kind of born again experience have we had if it calls for almost no personal sacrifice, produces almost no suppression of the world, and breeds practically no hatred for sin? How can we claim to be born from above? Where is the evidence of a new life and a new nature? We say, just confess Jesus is Lord and you're in. But he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now the question is, is this just the word of a man? It's just the opinion of some preacher? Let's ask Jesus. Because this was a very common teaching of Jesus when he said in John 12, 25, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. This was not, he didn't just say this here, he continued to say this throughout his life. Let me show you. In Matthew 10, when he sent out his disciples, He said, don't think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Later on, Peter Peter made the good confession, saying that you are the Christ. This is in Mark 8. And right after this, as as Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus started to tell them what that meant. And so he began to tell them that he must suffer at the hands of the chief priests and the elders, and he must die. And Peter said, never, Lord, not so. And Jesus looked, and he saw his disciples, and he knew that they would be poisoned by those words. And so he took Peter, and he said, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind, but the things of men. And then he said, Come here, all my disciples, come here. And crowds, come here. And he said these words. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. 
And in Luke 17, Jesus was, was talking about his return. And he said to his disciples, when the Son of Man comes, remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve their life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. So this, when you hear someone continually saying the same things over and over again, you know that it's important to them. Not that Jesus ever spoke any idle words, but you know that it's important. And something that all of us, if we're going to follow Christ, we all have to do this at times. Man up. Or woman up. Is that like a thing? I don't know. I'm not a woman and I don't know very many women. Jesus didn't soften the blow for people. He didn't, he didn't modify his words. He didn't make excuses. He didn't offer people comfort. He said the truth and he, and he lived it. And all of us are going to be sifted by these words. Whoever loves their life will lose it. Whoever preserves their lives will lose it. Whoever keeps their life will lose it. Whoever finds their life will lose it. There is coming a day, judgment day, when the words of Jesus, unalterable, straightforward, and simple, will find out the reality of our lives. And if that day reveals that we loved our lives, we're going to lose them. You know, I mean, Jesus just, he didn't ever make excuses. He, he didn't make any apologies. And he won't make any excuses for people who claim to be his followers, but who love their lives. It'll be very clear. Those words will stand as a testimony against them or us. He's not a respecter of persons, which can be good and bad. So what does it mean then to love our lives? It's really, really important for us to know. Jesus uses the Greek word phileo here, which is the word which describes friendship. And so Jesus is saying that if we're friendly with our lives, we will lose them. If we, if we have this affection for our lives, then we'll lose them. And, you know, I honestly, guys, I struggled. I thought and thought and thought and prayed and prayed and prayed. What are you getting at, Lord? Because I never want to make the narrow way any narrower than it already is. You know, I, but I, I don't want to, like, it, it's no good if you just heap burdens on people. And I don't want to do that. But, I mean, it's a little hard because Jesus really doesn't explain himself. But from reading and thinking and praying, I think, honestly, the, the best thing that I know to say is that when we see life primarily as a way to gain advantage for ourselves, then we're loving our lives. When we want something out of this world, we're, we're loving our lives. When we want something selfish, and we do that by using our resources to gain something for self. You know, I mean, like... So, there's a lot of talent in this room. There are a lot of giftings in this room. 
Some of you have the gift of creativity or hospitality. Some of you are really intelligent. Some of you guys have natural leadership or you're an organizer or you're a servant by nature. There's a lot of giftings in this room. And if we use our giftings as a way to get something for self, then we're loving our lives. If we just try to make ourselves comfortable here, or if we want the approval of man, or if we just want to feel better about ourselves, you hear what, I, hear what I'm saying? It's, this, it's a lust. It's no different than sexual lust. It's a lust for self. And we use what we have to get something for ourselves. That is to love our lives. And all of us, you know, we've been given time, and we've been given money, and we've been given, some of us have a lot of influence. And if we use those things for personal happiness, then we are loving our lives in this world. If we're just trying to satisfy our own desires, you know, if our time is all about what, can I, what will I enjoy, if our money is all, all about what can I buy that will make me happy and satisfied in this world, if our relationships are about personal fulfillment, then we're loving our lives. You know, I, we all have to come to grips with this. If the overall spirit that we're living in is about self, then Jesus says we will lose them. We will lose our lives. That was my whole life before coming to PLM. It, all I ever thought about was gratifying myself. And sometimes we'll have this reaction when we hear teachings like this, all like, oh, so what are you saying? You know, oh, so I can't have any money for myself. I gotta give away every cent I own, that's what you're saying? Otherwise I'm gonna go to hell. And I, I think what happens, honestly, I think what happens, our flesh hates the word of God. And it'll come up with any reason to discount the words of Jesus. Anything to just ignore or disregard. And so all of us, you know, we, we just need to be aware of that. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit, help me, subdue me. Don't let me just ignore your words or pass them off because they seem too difficult. Because Jesus doesn't make any apologies for himself. He's very serious. He's not, he, he will not modify his words for any human being. It's just truth. Sometimes we get this idea that <laughs> it's like, man, we're so me-centered that we imagine that the only expression of God's love could be that he wants whatever is best for humans. Friends, God loves righteousness and truth and justice more than he loves man. His devotion to man is in that he gave everything so that man could come. Not in that he's just going to overlook things because he's so nice. So he's very plain. If you love your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, you're going to find it. There is another option. And I, we should not miss this, you know? In the midst of the severity of his words, he who loves his life will lose it. We shouldn't miss the hope. He who hates his life in this world will keep it forever. Those are your options. And they are 
wonderful options. Here Jesus is, full of grace and truth. He's not like the law. The law is just absolutely unwavering, unbending in its condemnation of man. And Jesus is full of grace and truth. If you love your life, you'll lose it. But if you will hate it in this world, you will find it endlessly. And can't can we just be real? I mean, we loved our lives and it got us here and they're pretty miserable. So then the enemy, oh yeah, he comes, he just tell you, oh, if you hate your life in this world, oh, what a, I mean, bondage. Oh, really? Because I thought you already knew what bondage was. What he's offering you is Liberation. It is completely opposite of all of our American values, and it is completely opposite of our fleshly understanding of life. But it is life. Why hate this world? Because it's sinful? Because it's deceitful? Because the more you embrace life in this world, the more it destroys you? Because it's a shadow? There are plenty of reasons to hate your life in this world. There is a holy contempt for life that pleases God. It means something to God when you make choices not based on what's going to be most easy and comfortable and fun here, and you make choices for another world. And the more you mature as a believer, the more you will make choices based not here but there. And it will seem to be that you hate your life. I mean, let me ask you questions. Just kind of flesh this out a little bit. What if you believed what Jesus said about money when he said, use unrighteous wealth to gain friends for your own, to gain friends for yourself so that when this life wears out, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. What if you really believed that? What if every dollar to you was a way to prepare for another life so that you gave and gave and gave and gave So that you didn't have a lot of money for yourself. You didn't have a lot of money for toys and hobbies and vacations and fun. You just didn't have it because all that you thought about was there's another life coming and I'm sending it there. Wouldn't it seem like you hate your life? What if you thought about time as an investment that every second could be given for another world? And you, you didn't think about it in terms of what will be most enjoyable for me now. But what I am doing is I am investing in the kingdom of God because he told me that if I would hate my life in this world, I'm going to find it endlessly. Wouldn't it seem to someone like, man, this guy hates life. He's not, he's not doing things for himself. Our energy, we could view our energy that way. We could view our jobs that way. What if, what if we didn't take that promotion because we knew it's going to be more responsibility, more time, and I just, I'm, I'm not about that. I've got another world to live for. And so you passed it up. It would seem like you're nuts. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to lay out laws. I'm trying to give you a sense, an atmosphere, an idea of what it would mean to hate your lives in this world. Because Jesus isn't saying, thou must give away every penny, otherwise you're not on the road to life. He doesn't say, he, he, he makes no statements like that. But I'm trying to give you a sense about what it could mean to hate your life. Something could overtake the way you think that would make you so alien to this world. 
that you lived for another realm. And I guarantee you, there will not be a single person on their deathbed who will ever regret giving away money and time and energy. No one. Even the most godly men on their deathbed, their regrets, I wish I had given more. I wish I'd done more. The world can never understand people like that because we're living for realities that the world cannot see or embrace. All, every cent, every minute, every ounce of energy given for the cause of Christ will be returned to us exponentially in the life to come. Let me read Matthew Henry. There is a blessed reward awaiting those who hold this life in holy contempt. He that so hates the life of the body as to risk it for the preserving of the life of his soul shall find both with unspeakable advantage in eternal life. It is required of the disciples of Christ that they hate their life in this world. A life in this world supposes a life in the next. And we hate our lives in this world when we love it less than we love that life. Our life in this world includes all the enjoyments of our present condition. These we must hate. That is, we must despise them as being vain and insufficient to make us happy. We must dread the temptations that are in them, and we must cheerfully part with them whenever they come in competition with the service of Christ." See here much of the power of godliness, that it conquers the strongest natural affections. That's beautiful. And from the expositor, use your life for present gratification and you lose it forever. Renounce self, yield yourself to God, spend your life for the common good, regardless of whether or not you receive recognition for it, regardless of whether it's pleasing to you or not. And although your life may seem to be lost, you are finding it in its highest development. This is the law of life. The life that is sown not into yourself, but into others, develops into a fuller life. When you choose to live not for what you can get out of life, but for what others can receive, you find you have entered into a far more abundant life. By living for others, your own interests are widened. Your own desire for life increased. The results and ends of life enriched. And lastly, from F.B. Meyer. All through life, we must be prepared to erect altars on which to sacrifice all that hinders our highest service to our fellow men. The soul that dares to live in this way finds streams flowing from every smitten rock and honey in the carcass of every slain lion. Day comes from night, spring comes from winter, flowers comes from frost, joy from sorrow, fruitfulness from pruning, the olivet out of Gethsemane, and life out of death. But through it all, our aim must be that the Father may be glorified. <sighs> Sounds hard, doesn't it? Sounds almost impossible, doesn't it? Point number three. We need divine grace to die. We need divine grace to die. And I'll just end very briefly on a few thoughts here. Jesus is unwavering. If we will live, we must die. And yet... We can't do it on our own. Look at verse 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. 
In Jesus, we find the perfect blend of submission and dependence. And he would say these same words again, my soul is troubled. He would say it in the Garden of Gethsemane. On the night he was betrayed, he went to the garden and he, to- and he took his disciples with him and he told them, watch and pray with me that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went and he poured out his soul to God because he knew that what was coming was beyond human strength. And he, as a man, faced Gethsemane and the cross with absolute dependence on God. And so an angel came from heaven and strengthened him. And then he came back to his disciples and he found them sleeping and he told them, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he went and he sweat great drops of blood and he poured out his soul again to God in total submission and total total dependence. And the temptation in the garden was very, very real. Save your life. And Jesus knew, I cannot do this on my own. And so he watched and he prayed. But the disciples slept. And so at the critical moment, when strength was needed to do the will of God, Jesus had it and the disciples did not. He watched and prayed. They slept. He overcame. They fell. So I know that we emphasize the spiritual disciplines here, right? It's like the horse is dead and they're beating on it and then they're chopping it up and they're mailing it all across the country. I mean, that poor horse, that poor horse of prayer in the word, it is dead. <laughs> You cannot die on your own. You have to. You must die if you would live, and you can't do it on your own, which means you are utterly dependent on God for the grace to die. And you have a choice. Either you can fall on your face day after day after day in need of mercy, in need of grace, in need of strength, or you can depend on yourself. You have two options. Those who know that the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak will fall on grace and overcome. Those who will not admit their utter dependence will stay off their knees and they will fall. Jesus said, watch and pray so that you will have strength to stand before the Son of Man. That is very real to me. What is coming on the earth is not possible for us to overcome in human strength. And he's told us what to do. Fall on me, fall on me, fall on me, fall on me. Every day, every minute, every hour. And I praise the Lord. He, <laughs> he will show you your helplessness if you'll let him. If you'll learn the lessons, when you fall, if you will just admit, it's me again. This is who I am. This is who I will always be without divine grace. Then he will begin to live his life in you. And then when you begin to overcome temptations, it won't be like, yeah, wow, I did pretty good. It'll just be Jesus. You get all the glory. You get all the glory because I know who I am. I know who I am. And you are living your life in me. The issue isn't what you do on Sunday morning. The issue is the way you live your life from Monday to Saturday. The issue is who has your heart. What you cherish in your heart is what you are becoming like.
Friends and I are walking down the street, bam, Playboy magazine. Totally rocked my world. Uh, this lifestyle that I was living just got out of control. In a very short time, my life spiraled completely out of control. The whole time I've been looking at pornography, the longer I looked at it, it began to get progressively worse. I couldn't really explain what it was, but I was instantly addicted. You cannot take steps down a path and avoid arriving at the destination. God wants your heart, Satan wants your heart. Whoever has your heart will control you. Every time you sin, your desire for the things of God dies a little bit. Your faith dies a little bit. Your desire to be free dies a little bit. And with it, the hope to get free. So how do we win this war? And emerge with the victory that Christ has earned for us. What's missing is God's power to transform a person. For God to come in and do a work to set us free of, of something that has taken hold in our lives that we have allowed in there requires surrender. The Lord was able to show me that, yes, I can set you free from this. And hope, for me, was actually within reach. That was something I've never felt before. I don't care what kind of sexual sin you're involved in. I don't care how bound up you are. If you will sincerely apply the principles that are in that book, God will absolutely set you free.